Good morning. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce our keynote speaker for the morning, Dr. Robin Roberts. Dr. Roberts is a faculty member at the University of the West Indies um, uh, Faculty of Medical Sciences, and he's the director of the School of Clinical Research and Medicine in the, in the Bahamas. I'm going to make his introduction very brief because he's an outstanding speaker, and I think we need to give more time for him to give his presentation. But I'll just say this, that he is one of the um, major thought leaders in the Caribbean region, specifically as it relates to prostate cancer research. And he is also very committed to the community, has done outstanding work promoting screening and talking about the issues surrounding men's health and prostate cancer. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Roberts. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I was, uh, I was just waiting to see the community crowd, I had actually geared my talk towards the community. Um, so I'm hoping that there are quite a number of folks here from the community because my talk is geared towards that. But more importantly, it, it really just shows I was going to see how we could get the community out. That's a very difficult thing to do. Okay, and that's one of our major problems. But I really want to say um, greetings from the Bahamas. That's uh, where I've spent all my life except for studying. Uh, we just came through Hurricane Matthews, and I, our island and Nassau, we got the direct hit. So we had gusts up to 155 miles per hour. Did a lot of damage. So uh, my Minister of Health said, I want to remind you that winter is coming very soon in, the, in North America. And so while you're thinking about shoveling the snow through all the coal and your feet deep, I want you to remember this is one of the islands of the Bahamas, you see? The sand is so white that it's purple. I mean, it's pink. And it's all your beach for you to relax when it's cold in the winter, because after March, you, we need all the tourists we can get. So please remember us. <laughs> I, I really want to thank the organizers of this committee, of this meeting, because I think it's, it's a bold effort. It's quite a challenge to, to look at total health in a community like ours, and even a greater challenge to transforming the health in our community. And so I have been charged today to dare to challenge the fate of cancer in black Americans. And uh, in a true black uh, form, going back to the church, I would like to take my text today uh, from a, a book that I read some time ago called The Speaker's Handbook. And it tells a story of two boys by the river of fishing. And they notice a body floating down the stream. And they both jumped in, pulled the body out, and gave mouth to mouth resuscitation, and the patient survived. Uh, the next day, they went out fishing again. The same thing happened. They saw this body coming downstream. And this thing seemed to happen with repetitiveness that they had to go in. And so, noticing that sometimes because the nearest hospital was about 80 miles away, that some patients died during the resuscitation, they decided to build a community center there, which developed into a hospital. And this became famous. And a lot of the residents went there to do their specialization. And one of the interns one day after finishing, he said, listen, you know, I've, I really enjoyed my time here. It was a great experience, but you have all these bodies here. Um, you know, has anyone ever thought to find out why all these people are floating in the river and need to pull out? And the administrator says, you know, we really don't have the time. We're so busy trying to save the victims. We never have a chance to go upstream. And that's what healthcare is all about when I look at what's happening in our communities. We are so busy downstream saving the victims. We never really had a chance to go upstream and really appreciate it. If we went upstream, what we would find is there was a little walk over the, over the river and there were some loose planks. They didn't recognize they were loose and people were falling in. And so if they had fixed the planks for $100, they wouldn't have to build a $100 million service in a hospital. And so I want us to bear that in mind and I want to challenge the people from the community here and I want to challenge my health colleagues 
that we need to go upstream because that's where the challenge is. And so today what I want to do is I want us to look at what I consider the five W's of cancer. The who, the when, the what, the why. And so wherefore goes us in terms of going upstream. But, you know, we need to identify with things sometimes. So we need to put a face on the cancer so that we can really feel as if it's ours. It's something that we need to do. For me, that's a very easy thing. My father died at 69 because of colon cancer. I had a brother who died at 64 because of colon cancer. I had another brother who died at 73 for multiple myeloma. I had a younger brother at 44 who died of pancreatic cancer. So the face of cancer for me is real. And one of the other issues where I looked at it is that I noticed that last year in the U.S., they had about 27, 28,000 men who died of prostate cancer. I want you to imagine that each person that died had a spouse. They might have had at least two children. And each of those two children, they might have had about five grandchildren. They had at least about 10 friends. Well, if you multiplied it, for those 27,000 men, you've got about 500,000 people that lost the bout to prostate cancer. So I think all of us in this room has a face that we can put on prostate cancer. And so we've got a lot of work that we need to do if we're going to be looking upstream. There's too many victims. And then I want to engage you to look at yourself. Because a lot of times, you know, we don't, we, we, when we think of something like cancer, we think of the word death. Something's bad going to happen. So, you know, we repress it. We don't want to think about it. And so I said, you know, how we probably think about this cancer business is I think this is how an average person in the community would think about it. They would say, listen, you know, can I get this disease? Can I die from it? Because if I can't get it, I can't die of it. Why would I think about this thing? And now it seems that you might, you say, well, okay, what's it all about? Tell me something about it. And then you want to say, so why do I get it? How do I know I have it? Can I do something about it? And can I prevent it? And so I want you to think that maybe that's how we tend to think inside the community. And I just finally want to look in the room and say, okay, uh, how many in here under the age of 40? Because, you know, uh, there are some of us who believe when we get on the other side that truly on the other end of the spectrum that life really starts at 60. That's the good times, you know. The kids are gone now. You don't have to worry about college fees. The mortgage is being paid. You know, you can take the grandkids home on the weekend and then you can send them back. You know, you can, you, can, you can actually plan for some vacation and you have a little money put aside. Life really begins at, 50, at 60. Some say 70, some say 80. But the last thing you want to be doing is thinking about something when you are just about to enjoy life. Now, because I brought to mind a very good friend of mine, a senior pilot in our local airline. He was sent to me at the age of 56 by his general practitioner because his blood test for the prostate was up a little bit, so he was suspicious he might have had a cancer. He came to me, I talked to him. I didn't think much. I said, listen, I want you to come back. Let's repeat the blood test and see if it's accurate because he was feeling absolutely fine. I didn't see him for another four years. This time he came back to see me, his blood test had gone up about six times. Now he still felt, as far as he was concerned, there was nothing to worry about. He was feeling great and doing great. In fact, he came to tell me that he had reached the age of retirement. And he and his wife, they had just planned a world cruise. They were going on a world cruise for almost six months. He'd save up to do this. And I had to tell him, unfortunately, two weeks later, that all his results come back. Not only did he have prostate cancer, it was advanced. He had evidence of metastatic disease. He never made his trip. Every dollar he had was spent on trying to stay alive, but he died within nine months. That's not the time when you want to enjoy life, that you got to think about something that you could have prevented totally. So I want you to look at that 
from that perspective about the difference between treating the victim and being downstream as opposed to being proactive and going upstream. And so they asked me to think about prostate cancer central today and colon cancer and put it all in a perspective. If we live long enough as a man, there's no doubt in our minds, somewhere along the line, you will have to face that question. Can I get prostate cancer? Will I die from it? Because there's somebody you know close to you, directly or indirectly, has had this condition. Yes, yeah, so, back to those selfie questions. Can I get it? You bet you can. You got a one in seven chance that you can get it. We know that in America, they can estimate, look at those numbers. One man in 36 will die of prostate cancer. We diagnose a new case every 2.7 minutes. And every 19 minutes, a man dies from prostate cancer, if we use that from the amount. So you very likely will get it and you'll die from it. But here's the other thing that's striking. You ever see the incidence of prostate cancer in black men? Two to three times higher than we would see in our white counterparts. There's no doubt about it. And worse still, look at what happened in the men who died from prostate cancer. We are way up on the screen when it comes to black men. So not only can we get it, it can we die from it, it has even greater implications for us as black men. And when we look at the real data from the laboratory situation and from the clinical situation, we have a disease and black men is more progressive we're more likely to be obese and more likely to get it at an earlier age, at a younger age. Our blood levels to prostate cancer is higher. We're less likely to go and get a checkup. And if we do go get a checkup, it takes a longer period of time. In fact, most of us never get a checkup at all. Those are the facts. So, we started to say, well, okay, well, maybe I should learn a little bit about this prostate cancer. Tell, uh, you know, so what's it all about? Because a lot of men, you tell them what's the prostate and they don't know what it is. They heard about it, they don't know what it does and what it is. So, so let's just look quite simply. Well, there we all realize we have to have two kidneys that make some urine. The urine has to collect in the bladder and, the, and then it comes out. Well, before it comes out, right underneath the bladder, there's this little walnut size, smaller than a golf ball size little gland to which the bladder has to pass out in order to get to the outside. So what does this little prostate thing do? Well, I don't know what it does, but I tell you three things I realized. There's something isn't right about this. God made a mistake somewhere. Because the first thing he did is he put it in the wrong place. You can't feel it, you can't see it, and men say you have to put your finger in the back passes to feel it, and that's not good. You know, that's great fear. The second thing about it which is fascinating though, is that it is the only tissue in the body that grows forever. When you reach about 40 years of age, the prostate starts to grow, and it never stops growing. In that prostate, there is a secret to life long living. If we know why, it continues to do that. Unfortunately, uh, when it grows so big, it just closes and compresses, and then you have problems passing urine and so forth. So that, you know, so in those men that, that, that have that, it, it's, a, it's a big problem. But the third thing about it, not only it grows, sometimes, unfortunately, it grows because it has a cancer in it. And that cancer, when it first starts, it starts off very small. And it actually grows very slowly. And for you to be able to feel that prostate, you can't feel it from in the front. There's a big bone in the front here. You have to put your finger in the back passage and to feel it to reach a size. It has to be about the size of a, a green pea or a pigeon pea. That's about just a quarter of an inch size. It has to be a, a, a fairly big size to feel it. It takes about almost 10 years to grow to that size to feel it. And so what happens in that first 10 years? The man doesn't know what's there. It doesn't pain. Even the doctor can't feel it. And so if nothing's happening, it continues to grow. Now, when it reaches this second stage size, now it's easy for the doctor to feel. The patient still would know the prostate is there because it's not disturbing anything. He's doing great. And then finally, it'll continue to grow. Now it's blocking the urine passage. 
Now he complains about problems of being able to pee. Now this might break off and he might have some bleeding. Now he might have problems with the kidneys not working. But the damn thing's been there for at least 10, 12 years now. The horse is already out of the barn. So when they do feed it, you've got advanced disease. That's too late. You've got to find a way in which we can do that from an earlier stage. Because when it reaches the final stage, fourth stage, now the, the cancer is breaking off, we call it metastasizing, and at that end of the game, uh, it, you will die. We have some things that we can try and prevent that, but at this stage, there's, very, there's not much we can do other than trying to improve uh, your quality of life. So, we know this is a bad disease. We know that uh, we need to be able to detect it while it's still in its early stage. So we're going to ask that question, okay, good, good. It seems as if I could get it, it could be a bad thing. So, but why is this thing happening to me? Well, there are many reasons, but I want to focus on two of them. One is in the genes. Yeah, we're born with a predisposition to have it. Now, why exactly that comes out, we'll mention that. And secondly, it's in the food. So, but just for a moment, when we talk about the genes, I want to highlight this very important part because this is a big problem. I'm also sure in the black community, but also in the Bahamas where we are, because cancer, breast cancer in women is our number one cancer. I think it's the number one cancer in, in, in uh, black women in America as well. But the other interesting thing in the Bahamas is that we have found that there's an underlying abnormality or mutation in the gene that seems to be a major factor in this cancer formation. In fact, when we have tested our women who have breast cancer, we have found that 20% of the women who have breast cancer have a bad gene. That's the highest in the world. So our, men, our women are therefore dying of breast cancer at a very young age because they have this underlying gene mutation. And they can tell you very clearly, therefore, that if you have the bad genes, you're likely to have cancer by the time you, before you're 50, 50%. 50 by the time you, you are 70, it goes up to 70%. Well, we think this same gene might have some involvement in prostate cancer as well. There's evidence to show that in men, that if you have this gene, that you might have a 30 to 40% more likelihood that you might have prostate cancer. In fact, one of the most interesting things for me is that all the time, as I mentioned earlier this morning, one of the, one of the uh, interesting things for me with regards to this, this mutation is all along we used to think that women were giving it to their daughters. But now we begin to appreciate maybe it is the men who were giving it to their daughters. We need to look at this thing, and particularly in our black community, we need to have a second look at this. Uh, but there's no doubt, and, and if you have just to note anyone who has prostate cancer, the likelihood that your family member, in terms of you, if you had a father, if you had an uncle, if you had a brother, your chances of having or inheriting that gene is two to three times more than anybody else. And then, of course, yes, the food. You know, black people, we love our food, okay? And we like the worst kind of food. The food that's high, not only in calories, but more at high in fat. And the evidence is very, very clear with regards to the involvement of fat as a causative agent to some extent in breast cancer, I mean in, brost, in prostate cancer. And one of the classical ex studies that have been shown is that in this interesting line of prostate cancer, that everybody, all men, if we live long enough, will probably have prostate cancer. But it's unlikely that it will ever become clinical, that we'll ever have a problem with it. And what they found is that over in the, if you're an Asian, particularly like in Japan, yes, your incidence of having this low-lying prostate cancer is just as high, but there is never a clinical problem. You're less likely to die from prostate cancer. But if those, if those same Japanese move to America where the diet changes, you find that the incidence of having this clinical cancer increases significantly. We've been able to show in the laboratory situations on prostate cancer in animals that if you increase the fat content of the animal's feed, then you'll increase the growth of the prostate cancer. And similarly, if you decrease the fat content, you can decrease the, the, the growth of that prostate cancer. So the link between obesity and fat in the food and prostate cancer is real. So 
And increasingly, we also show, as we talked earlier on, similarly, that if we have a good, you become a good vegan, you get those nice vitamins and that exercise, that your chances of, is, you're less likely to have prostate cancer. More importantly, we found that if you have prostate cancer and you've been treated for prostate cancer, and if you improve that exercise and your diet, that you will decrease the recurrence and less likely to die of prostate cancer. So there's no doubt in our minds that how we look at ourselves with regards to what we eat, how we eat, how we exercise, has a major impact on prostate cancer. So we then say, okay, well, we have about, so, so how do we know we have it? Now we sparked enough that, yes, this is bad, we can get it, there's something we might be able to do, so how do I know I have it? Well, here are the facts. You don't. In that first, that first 10 plus years of having prostate cancer in its early stages, you feel absolutely fine. You're healthy, you're normal. So unless you are specifically looking to see if that early cancer is there, you would not know. That's when you should be going upstream. And so, because most of them, that's when they appear at this advanced stage. When the horse is on the barn and you have the symptoms to complain that you've got prostate cancer. So, we need to be able to test. We need to go upstream. Well, we are very fortunate that the first test we had was the finger. And I normally would say to my men that uh, this is a magical finger because I've never known so many men feel that they have been violated. Some say I feel I've been raped. Some say they think I will, they will, in Jamaica, in the Caribbean, you know, unfortunately we have a very homophobic society. And you will be surprised at men, and I mean educated men, tertiary level education, who will tell you that they will not go to the doctor because they don't want a doctor sticking that finger in their back passage. Seriously. So uh, we advocate getting your annual checkup with a prostate. The problem is you're going to miss a lot because in that first 10 years, the prostate cancer normally has not developed to the stage where you can peel it. So digital examination has a, it, its specificity and sensitivity is quite inferior compared to this. We now have a blood test to be able to detect that this molecule is produced by the prostate under normal circumstances, but if there's prostate cancer, it's at high levels. So if you suspect the prostate level is high, then there's a pretty good evidence that you might have prostate cancer. That's a chance to check it out. But it's far from a perfect test. Because uh, yes, while it's elevated, the truth is that there are quite a number of things that can cause an elevation of the blood test that has nothing to do with cancer. So it's a disease which is very, very, very sensitive. It can pick up very small prostate cancer, but in the early stages of elevation, it is very poorly specific. And so that's quite a problem. Uh, so the good news is that if we pick up prostate cancer early enough, if it's confined to the prostate, we, we can cure this disease. As good as we can say cure, you live a full lifetime and you're less likely to have this prostate come back. We have advanced so much today that even if you have the disease which is outside the prostate, we've got enough good treatment that we can actually control it. And that's not bad. I try to get my patients to understand there are a lot of things that we have today that we can't cure, but we can control. We can't, con we can't cure hypertension. We can't cure diabetes, but we can control them. People can live their full life. The same thing we try to look at a cancer survivor. We can do the things to try to control this cancer and give us a full lifetime of enjoyment. And so these are some of all the... Uh, the treatment modalities, and that's a talk for another day with regards to what we can do, but we can re cut it out, we can radiate it, we have even a new fancy treatments where you don't have to use, uh, take out the whole prostate or obliterate the whole prostate. In fact, we begin to appreciate that 
Sometimes we might not even have to do anything. We can watch this cancer for a little while. And in the advanced stages, these are some of the great medications that we have that can now improve. One time ago, if you had an advanced prostate cancer, 50% of the men died uh, within three years. Now, so what should we do about it? Well, get our blood test every year, get your prostate exam every year, and because we've realized that one of the inaccuracies of this PSA is in very aggressive prostate cancer, sometimes the cells are so poor that they can't even produce the PSA. So your PSA blood levels are normal, but when you put a finger in, in up to 15% of cases, you feel a very abnormal, obvious prostate cancer. So we advise men to have both of them. And we should start, we should do this between the 40 and 70 years of age. Now, just when we thought we were on to something, and uh, so I try to encourage my men to have both of them and don't be so frightened. And in order to appreciate too that uh, we talked a little bit about diet and exercise, I see it's on the program, and I hope that you'll go through this and look at what are the advantages uh, just in terms of staying in shape. But the one thing I want to, in all of this, I think that I had mentioned earlier to one of my colleagues, is that what is good for the heart is good for the prostate. <laughs> Exercise, good eating, okay, eating the proper things. Uh, there's a lot to be said about vegetarian di diet. If it's good for the heart, it's good for the heart on. It's good for the prostate. Uh, that's the message I try to get to the community. And, and we can see very clearly at five years the chances of being alive and free of cancer if you have very early disease. But here's the problem. When we treat this disease, it is not without its problems. When we do that surgery, don't mind what the doctors tell you that how great they are. The truth of the matter is the patients tell you it ain't so. We have problems controlling the urine. The worst thing that you can say to man is that he has to wear some pads or some pappas. You know, overnight, he's, as far as he's concerned, he's a cripple. Uh, we have problems with doing biopsies. We have patients die doing biopsies. And of course, even if you're not treating them, they always have the fear of having this cancer that's sitting there and wondering what's going to happen. So these are serious quality of life issues that we have to deal with prostate cancer once we have the disease that we have to treat, even if it's in a very early stage. So it was not surprising that one of the articles that came out that spurred the band of the community was one of the patients who, very good patients, did his PSAs all the time, elevated, came back, found, he had prostate cancer, had his operation. But listen, after a, couple of, after a year or two and realized that the complications were so high, he said, listen, I wanted to have my prostate back. The treatment should never be worse than the disease. And so we began to realize that even all prostate cancer is not the same. We talk about the tortoise and the hare. Then we, have even the, we even have the doves. At the end of the day, we realize that there are basically two groups of cancers. There's a good group. That's the cancer that grows so slowly that it might never, ever be visible as having any problem. So we don't need to treat it. We just need to watch it. And then there's the aggressive type, the type of cancer which takes off. That's what my pilot had. Within nine months, despite the attention that we gave him, he happened to be the 10% the that didn't even respond to first-line treatment. And at that time, we didn't have any chemotherapy. So within nine months, he was gone. So we realized there are these two types of cancers. And the problem was, uh, how do we determine which type you have? And so, at the end of the day, the first thing though was, can we pick up those individuals who have prostate cancer at that early stage so that we could determine to treat them or not? Because if that early, we might not even have to treat them. We might just watch them. We have this type, we have the new term now we call surveillance, whereby we recognize their prostate cancer but we can look to see if their blood test is rising. We can biopsy them again to see if the type of cancer is becoming more aggressive. 
And if those things aren't happening, then we don't need to treat them. That is an indication that they are the good type. And so that's what this active surveillance is. But at the end of the day, I just want you to appreciate what we really mean by when we say screening. When we look at our population of men and we want to say, here is this condition in our community which so many men are having. They are presenting an advanced disease. It's causing us a lot on our healthcare dollars. It's causing a lot with regards to quality of life. So it's a big burden in the society. It's potentially preventable if we can get them at this very early stage. So how can we identify those men? Because if we do, then they wouldn't die. And that's what screening is all about. The critical word in screening is that you can pick up that disease early enough that the patient will not die because of the cancer. So the sine qua non of screening is that you must show five years down the line, 10 years down the line, I'm doing this screening, I'm sending all these people out, I'm spending all this money to do the screening on these healthy people to tell them, listen, catch this thing very early, but I must show down the line, yes, I've been successful. Success is we've dropped our death rate from this cancer. Because if you haven't dropped the death rate, then you don't have a good screening test. And so, with that in mind, the question came, so is PSA really a good screening test? Are you making a difference when you pick up this cancer at a very early age? Well, the best way to do that experimentally is have one group of men who are not screened and watch them and see if they get cancer, and have another group of men who you are screening and if they get cancer, you pick it up early, you treat them, but five and 10 years down the line, you'd recognize, hey, this group, uh, we picked up the cancer early and they're not dying, and this group who picked it up, they came late, they, a significant number of them died. And you randomly select those two groups of men. So we had two great experiments coming on all along, and so we did one in, North, in America, and on the other side of the Atlantic, we did one in Europe. The one in America had about 86,000 men that they randomized into screening or not screening. In the European group, they had something like 160,000 men, or 180,000 men. They randomized half, half whom they screened, and the other they didn't screen. And so seven years down or later, when they cracked open the code to see, okay, how did they do? In America, they said, listen, there was no difference whether I screen or not. We had the same amount of men die. Europe, however, they said, hey, no, no, no. We found that uh, we saved 20% of the men. 20% of the men, less men died. So we didn't solve the answer. We didn't solve the question. We are back to square one. And the other side of the coin was that they then said, listen, you are picking up this disease so early. You got about a million men who you with this aggressive prostate cancer screening, you treated them, they didn't need to be treated, their disease would never be in progressive, they wouldn't have had all those complications, we wouldn't have spent all this money on CASR test showing. You made no difference. And so the guru, the United States Preventive Services Task Force, said that all of this PSA screening, as far as we are concerned, we're giving it a D rating. In other words, it has no value and no benefit. In fact, it's going to cost you more harm than good. Now, where does that leave the public? Okay? Well, you know, the reality is that the screening thing also has a financial implications. That's the first thing. So the insurance companies love this. The government even love it. Because this was a study, it was done just in 1990. That's almost, not how long ago? Almost 30 years ago. Just if you had all the men in America between the ages of 40 and 75 who had screening by rectal examination and had a PSA blood testing, and then there's a section who might need some prostate cancer uh, biopsies, okay? So, you're looking at billions of dollars. In fact, 
if you did this for all the men and you looked at those who needed something and a repeat test if it was over four or over ten, you had a bill that they could compute to almost five hundred billion dollars. And so when you look at healthcare from that perspective, just for screening alone, there is great reason why some people would <coughs> welcome the report of the task force that this was an unnecessary test. And so is PSA screening useful or useless? You are seeing this same question being asked from time to time in the mammograms. Same thing happens. They're saying, should women get a mammogram or not? Does it have any value? Is it really decreasing our mortality? Same question. Because we're spending a lot of money. Is it worth it? Because the marker is mortality. Now, I have a, uro I have a urological uh, um, opinion. And so when my patients come in and they say, should we be tested or not? Then I give the facts. The facts are, whether it's directly related to the PSA or not, over the last 10 to 20 years, we have seen a decrease in prostate cancer deaths in those countries that have active PSA screening by over 40%. We have seen that the amount of men presenting with advanced prostate cancer and metastases has decreased by 75%. Prior to PSA screening, with men who presented with prostate cancer for the first time, on average, about 80% of men presented with advanced disease. In the era of PSA, it has turned around. We've had a stage migration. 80% of them now present with early disease, undetectable disease. We have increased the survival rate and showed very clearly. So from a urological perspective, I think there's great value. And it's interesting to say, from this preventive task force, they don't even recommend that black men need to have screening. Because as far as they're concerned, the evidence from the studies are not there. Well, here was the reality again. This is from a global scan looking at prostate cancer deaths throughout the world. See where we are in the Caribbean? We are still 20 years down the line. It's as if PSA screening was never there. Look at where you are in North America. So I have to think very hard when we talk about what is the value of screening in our black community. In the Bahamas, this is our data. We went to look at mortality during the period of time from, 1990, from 1985, I came home in 86, 87, to 2011. This is the death rate in the Bahamas. What you see is this line doing this. In North America, that line has been doing this. Our 80% advanced prostate cancer on presentation has not changed. Another interesting light is one of my favorite uh, um, photographs. This is, these are all Caribbean men. You might recognize Sidney Poitier and Harry Belafonte and, and our previous uh, 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 brother Powell. They all had prostate cancer. They all alive and well. They all had early cancer. So why are these intelligent Caribbean men, the Prime Minister of Jamaica, the Prime Minister of the Bahamas, one of our leading cabinet ministers, all educated tertiary men, tertiary education males, they all died of advanced metastatic prostate cancer. I think it's the way we think about the disease and the way we feel we need to go for early detection. So the key thing for us, the reality is still has not changed. We have not seen stage migration. We have not had a decrease in mortality. We still have increased metastatic uh, presentation. We have increased morbidity, despite the fact that there are better surgeons and better radiation and better and active waiting. These things have not changed for us in our black communities. So I want to take a moment and just look at colorectal cancer. 
which the evidence is very clear, is the most preventable, but the least prevented cancers. If we take the same dictum that we did very quickly, can I get it? Yes, it's very common. Okay, we're able to show there's number two cancer, both in men and women. You have a one in 20 chance you could get it. If you have a family history, that goes up by a factor of two to three times. Uh, you're more likely to get it as we age. And you've got quite a lot of people who are surviving from colon cancer. So that's something to look at. And then uh, who gets it? Look here where we are again. Here are the non-Hispanic whites. Here is the, where the African, we topping the lot again. Both in terms of incidence, both in terms of death rate. We topping the lot again. And here is the thing, can you die from it? If you get early disease, if you go upstream, you're less likely. If you don't, you're looking at the victim. The evidence is very clear where we are. At five years, nine out of 10 will have survived this disease if it's early. If it's advanced, the chances are less than one, plus one out of 10 will survive this disease. So can you die from it? Yes, if you are late. So then you say, well, back to square one. Can we, what is this all about? Yeah, you have to understand the colon. We have our small intestines, our large intestine. This is where all the action is. So this is the part of the bowels that absorb the food. And this is the part of the bowel in which we uh, get rid of all the waste. So in this colon, which is very likely to do have our prostate cancer, and we realize here is the key thing for us. It's called colonoscopy. Yeah, we sure we got this huge, this long tube, which we have to pass up. It's about five foot long, but that's just the length of the colon. And uh, so once you've cleaned that colon out, and the doctor inserts that tube, he puts it all the way up around so we can see every aspect of the colon. And uh, so we can pick up those early diseases. And this is what the clean colon looks like. And actually looks, it's just some mucous memories. If you look inside your mouth and your gums, that's exactly what it, a clean colon looks like. That's what it looks like if it's not so clean. But uh, when we look inside the colon, we can see these little, these are things which are just a quarter inch in size. So we can see the early start of a, prostate can of a colon cancer. And we know that this does not happen overnight. We know that it starts off very small, where there's a change in the cell, and that change becomes worse, and then it turns into a frank cancer cell, and then it becomes an invasive cancer cell. But that takes quite a number of years to happen. It doesn't happen overnight. And we can still pick it up at this very early stage. Okay? And this is what the colonoscope will do. We can pick, we can have a look, this is a virtual image. This is the real thing. You have this small little one centimeter early beginning of a cancer, you can just put this snare and remove it until when you reach this age, when you now have a big cancer in the colon, it's already blocking it up. And you can see, you're gonna present now where you, you have a bowel obstruction. Again, okay. advanced and end-stage disease. It, are you upstream? We know that if you've got a family history, that your chances of happening and having, you're one in three likely to have that prostate, that, that colon cancer. So why don't you go upstream at this point in time and get the colonoscopy? Why can't we do that? Okay? Why can't we be at this very early stage here where there are no symptoms? Because when the symptoms occur, the horse is out of the barn. It's almost identical to prostate cancer. Uh, so what do you need to do? You need to have your colonoscopy. They're telling you, once every 10 years. Once every 10 years. If you have family history, once every five years, okay? Uh, they, you don't have to do this colonoscopy. It might be expensive. You can look partially with just one segment, but we can do testing for cord blood, which can also give us a pretty good idea where we might have something and then lend towards colonoscopy. Now we can do a virtual colonoscopy. So, and there's also very heavy evidence to show the same thing that we find in prostate cancer, controlling our weight, by our diet and our physical activity is keystone in cancer prevention. I remember listening to uh, the first, the first uh, lecture by Dr. Burkett from Britain when he looked at the impact of fiber and its possibility of having colon cancer. Di very minimal dietary changes. 
but uh, it's, it's still is debatable now in terms of the impact of fiber, but there's every reason to believe that a good fiber diet definitely still seems to be a causative agent here. But what do we ask you? One hour every five to ten years can prevent colon cancer. That's what we're talking about. And note on cervical cancer, one very dear to my heart. You have the uterus at the opening of the uterus and the cervix where we have a possible underlying cancer because this one really at the end of the day, the evidence is very clear. We have a decreased incidence and we've had a decreased mortality. Why? Because we have screening. Best example of screening you ever want to see. Something very easy to do, something which is inexpensive, something which has very little morbidity or mortality in terms of doing this test. Has a definite impact. Okay, and what they have shown is that if you now increase the amount of screening, you you find less and less cancers because cervical cancer in 2016 is a totally preventable disease. No woman should even be diagnosed with cervical cancer, more or less dying from cervical cancer. It's not supposed to happen. We are not supposed to be victims. We should be floating upstream. That's how effective we become in terms of preventing disease. But back to square one again. What is the incidence? Well, the incidence is that uh, we are still high up there in terms of black women. But what about dying? We are way up there, higher than everybody else. What's wrong with our community? It's a recurrent theme. We are just the victims. And now, with the introduction of the vaccine, the introduction of the vaccine, well, we should be dispensing this in all our clinics, in both men and women. Because we realize that we've got a virus that's underlying cervical cancer, and we can prevent the virus just as we do our vaccinations being so, has, has been so effective. We do not need to have our women dying at an early age from cervical cancer. So pain, suffering, and dying from cancer is not our, dense, our destiny. We do not need to be the floating victims in the water. I'd like to bring a topic then and now because we're going we're gonna to look again at some of the reasons why. why. Why is it? What's wrong with us? Well, this is a favorite topic of mine in terms of uh, men. And why, why is particularly men in this prostate cancer? Well, I think that for anyone who was taken a liking to trying to understand this construct of males, and particularly this construct of men in our black community, I believe that this is our problem right here. We've got a problem in trying to define who we are and what we identify as being a man. What does it take to be a man? But this is very interesting. We go to church all the time. And if I in church and I gave a talk like this in church, and I would have asked all the men in the church, no matter what age, what does it take to be a man? I'm telling you, 90% of them will come up with one of these five. And the more you press, they'll all include these. You gotta protect your family. You gotta provide for them. You must be a leader. You gotta have your family. These are all a part of your male responsibilities. We were brought up like this in the church, in our male organizations, if you're a mason or whatever. This is, this is, this is real stuff. The truth of the matter is, when we sit on the blocks, when we out having a few drinks and some, you know, some bears with the boys, when we talk about what it is and what we identify to be a man, this is who we are. You know what I mean? You're not supposed to be showing emotions. and supposed to be stoic. And you're supposed to bear the pain no matter what it is. You're not supposed to show it. Risk-seeking behavior is a part of being us as men. You know, drinking and driving and, and uh, trying to dare to jump off something you shouldn't be off. Of course, our sexual progress goes without question. You know, you can't just have one woman and two women. That includes having children and all that. And you're not supposed to get sick and you're not supposed to visit doctor and so on. This is what real men is about. 
Now, when you put the two of them, and then we raise our boys to be like that. We want them to be like big and strong and better and faster, and we teach them how to be like that. They'll follow in our footsteps. The truth of the matter is that when we now put the two of them together, what we are taught and what we are, we really schizophrenic. In terms of identifying who we are. I, I'm a little, um, you know, so we need to really, I think, go back in our communities and we need to define, we need a reflection about this whole issue of masculinity. What we want to be, what we will define masculinity to be, and then we need to exemplify it. I just want to say I think there are certain things which are great about being masculine. The willingness to sacrifice personal needs and desires for the sake of providing for dependence. That's good stuff. The willingness to withstand hardship and pain to protect our loved ones. We'd be the first one when we got to go to war. The men line up, they're ready to go. The willingness to take on and try to solve other people's problems. That's, that's what we consider a man supposed to be. Expressing our love, integrity, steadfast, loyalty. He said, you know, and no matter what, you know, that we are be the first one to jump out in the face of danger. So that's what a real man does. So we got some good male qualities here. But we need to put that now into redefining our man. How we take care of ourselves, how we respect and honor our spouses. I mean, gender-based violence is a serious thing in our communities. We need to look at our financial responsibility, how many kids we want to have that we are able to care for, our community service, crime watch, mentorship, male groups, okay, voting, honoring our symbols. I'm not getting into that thing with the American flag and the anthem now, but I'm just looking at it from the global perspective. But these are the things that we have to do. Now, how we do that, that's a different story. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to discuss that today in those breakout sessions. And more importantly, we've got a lot of kids out there, one-parent families, two out of every three kids born out of a, a marital commitment, never had a, farm, a, a father figure. So those who are fortunate enough to have had one and have been raised that way, we have to share the responsibility. Those are really real. And so it brings me back to why the prostate to me is so important and why I have been pushing the prostate envelope. Because as a real man, a black man, we are concerned about our sexual performance. The prostate, as far as we know, that has something to do with our sexual function. And so if the prostate goes bad, then our sexual, mal our prostate, then our sexual will be malfunction. And so that's why they come. They come because one of their friends on the block say, boy, you better check your prostate. I had a patient the other day, unbelievable. He, he comes to me, he's 56, the first time he's ever had his prostate checkup because his friend told him to come. He had a blood pressure of 240 over 140. The last time he went to the doctor was when he had a cut on his arm, he said, when he was 21 years old. But he wasn't worried about that. He was worried about his prostate working okay. So as far as I can see, that prostate... And that PSA, you know, that's the hook. We are able to catch him, okay? Because the prostate is a window to his soul and his sexuality. That's the first opportunity we're going to get. His foot is in the door. So let us go forward. You see, because on one hand, when it's very clear of our death rate, that prostate cancer is definitely the major cause of death in men, particularly black women. That's not what, that's not, that's not what kills us. It's not the prostate cancer that kills us. It's the heart disease that's killing us. The high blood pressure, the diabetes, the fact it has. So when the men come in, we now have them for the first time. We got to hook them. So when I have my cancer screening clinic, I try to have, I try to have the, the, uh, the, the, the fitness group at the same time, taking their blood pressures, checking their weights, checking their cholesterol, checking their blood sugar because I might not get this opportunity again. So when we're looking at uh, that hole, we're looking here at the pathways to heal and to transform and to improve our health care from this holistic picture, I just want to make a note. 
that are not only talking about men, the women in the same way. You see, if you look at this same, can this, this same program here with regards to cervical cancer in women, this global scan, here it is, mortality and incidence rate. See that here? Where are we all right here? Developing countries. Caribbean right here. See on these new, it's almost down to zero. In our country, we found that only 20% of women in the sexually active age group or above have their PSA, their, their pop test when they should. It's a common problem. It's not just confined to men, women too. So as we come there at the end, we realize that we talk a lot about cancer and the issues in cancer, but really it's just the tip of the iceberg when we look at this whole disease burden in our community. Because the real thing is that what's really killing us here, here's cancer, and here is cardiovascular disease. Yeah, the infections are over here. Diabetes, small portion. So right here is where we have to, we have to swim upstream. And just to show you again, cardiovascular hasn't changed. Here are the white men, white women. Here are our black men and women. We're way up there in terms of our cardiovascular death, most of them being related to heart, heart attack. Look at our diabetes, again. Black population, incidents, we're way up there. We got serious health problems. We are the victims. We're treating the victims. We need to stop being downstream. It's time for us to go upstream. This is the part that really hurts. Because when we look at this, we take that selfie and we look at ourselves, we look at ourselves and we say, why? Why is this? We got a serious perception as to who we are with regards to our health and how we think about our health. Because this is a healthy family. They eat together and they're very proud. In fact, we have reached a stage whereby we even want to make sure our children, because we're way up there now in terms of obesity in our children. In my country, we are now seeing children in, who are teens because of our obesity problem. We are, we are considered to be one of the fattest countries in the world now. We are seeing teenagers in school presenting with type 2 diabetes. 20 years ahead of their time. This is what diabetes and hypertension and obesity does for us. Okay? Leading the charge in terms of cardiovascular disease, among anything else. We got a major black problem. So what about this thing then? in terms of this health problem that we have? Well, we say that health is this physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease. But is there something in our culture where we have a different perception of health? Is it us? Well, we now think that being overweight is sexy. They don't see it as being unhealthy. There's something in it for everyone. It is what it is. We talk about an accident. It's one of my favorite slides. An accident. If I had a, some young brothers at a party and they drank quite a bit of alcohol. One jumps into the car to drive and the rest jump in as well. The road is wet and they're saying, I bet you can't take this curve. And he tries to do it at 90 miles an hour. And this is what happens. There was nothing accident about that. You could tell that was going to happen. If you're not taking your blood pressure medications, if you're not taking your diabetes medications, if you're not getting your regular and early checkup for your prostate cancer, for your colon cancer, for your cervical cancer, what accident it is that you have a cancer? And what accident it is that you have advanced disease? What accident it is that you will die from it? Okay? This is a very common one. This is one of the reasons why a lot of men, because they realize their, 
Medications affect their sexual function, so they must prefer to die a heart rather than have the penis die or to get it treated. This is real because our sexual performance is more important than controlling our blood pressure. Would we think about this? Early detection is our best protection. Yes, but at the end of the day, do we really believe that? Because we're not having the habits to do that. Now, we put this all in the context of health disparities. And as you know, this is a big area. Where do we have the available resources, affordable, appropriate, equitable, justice, and all that, right? It's very, it's clear that it's all about we have inferior outcomes. And these are real issues. But one of the problems someone like me has is that I'm in a country where we are 85% black. My prime minister is black. All my school teachers are black. I went to black school where we had the best performances. So uh, our healthcare system is, I think, better than America. We might not have top Mayo clinics. But in terms of availability and accessibility and affordability of care, a lot of, we, we, I think we do a little better than that. But we have those same problems. There has to be something else. I think that we need to have a look at that selfie again. That health is not a matter of chance, it's a matter of choice. You know, that is something that, as Nike would say, we have to do it. And that earlier person on the platform said, take care of your body. But it's the only place you have to live. And if we go back to the Christian era, where we say the body is a temple of the Lord, we're not doing a good job. So I finally want to just mention a few words that it's not health we need to be talking about. It's wellness we need to be talking about. Now, this takes health up to another level. This is really going upstream. Because this is a lifestyle change. It's not just saying you do something. You actually have to change your lifestyle. Okay? And it's something that's dynamic. It's something that you're continuing to do because you want to be in the best health that you can be in in order to enjoy life. Okay? It's about playing and working. It's about self-responsibility and loving yourself. And here are those pillars of wellness. It is your personal responsibility. Now, I had a stepdad, and I tell you, I remember the day he bought his first car, a SS Super Sports, Chevy. And even when he had a stroke, he still got up every day and cleaned his car. My sisters don't miss the weekend. They will get that wee fix. They will get them nails done. All right? Because those are the things that matter to them. But their health and the personal responsibility to do that. It's in there. You need to look at your nutritional awareness. You need to look at our physical fitness. And then also says being the evidence to me is very clear that you are not, it is good to be uh, uh, as fit as you can when you are fat, but it's very, very clear the evidence to show that people who are obese or overweight do not benefit as well as those people who are in the category of weight they should be, and they are fit. It's good to be fit even though you're overweight, but it's better for longevity and for quality of life if at the same time you are fit and lose the weight. When we talk about stress and we talk about our environment, the only thing that I want to leave with you in this regard, this is a study that was done a couple of years ago from Scandinavia. They looked at about 20,000 men. And they said, let's look at these key factors. They made sure all of them, they were non-smokers. They basically didn't drink, just social, maybe a glass of wine or two. They all were in the weight category. They were eating a good nutrition in terms of their balanced diet. And they were doing a reasonable amount of exercise. So they took of those 20,000 men, all in good shape, doing those things, just those five things. And they followed them for 10 years. And they looked at them again at the end of 10 years. And what they found was that those men who kept in that category, they decreased the likelihood of having a heart attack by 86%.
Just staying in shape. Not smoking, not drinking, eating well, exercising. Decrease the heart attack by 86%. Do you know how many of those 20,000 men actually stayed in that category? 5%. 5%. So it's quite a challenge. So I end with that challenge is what you have to look at for you. Every Thursday in the Bahamas, in our newspaper, we have an obituary set supplement. And so you look and see all the people who have died. We have a small community. Everybody knows everyone. We've got about 300,000 people. And the first thing strikes you as you start to reach over 50 and 60 is that more than half of the people in the obituary are younger than you. So you know it's only a matter of time before you'll be looking at your face inside that. A lot of them are your friends. My mother's 94 now. She's the only one around. No brothers, no sisters, no friends. You live long enough. Okay? You also realize you're not doing the things that you were able to do. That's the reality of aging. But we want to see our children grow. We want to play with your grandchildren. You still want to enjoy life and go on that world cruise. And so I, I have, I leave you with what I call a robber's dictum. You know, when you, when I was, uh, when you are, f when, when you are 20, you project as the young, full of life, you're never going to die. 20 years from now, what would I become? Who would I become? And one day you wake up, lo and behold, you are 40. Because the chance of, the chance of you when you are 20, you live in another 20 years, that's 95% or more. The chances are you're going to live to see 40. You look back and see, did I do it? And then one day you wake up, you're 50. And then you say, now, 20 years from now, things change. That means you should be 70. But you know that only a third of us will live to see 70. You know that only a third of us if we live to see 70, do know we there or wish we weren't. And then there's the good to it. I can wake up in the morning and say, you know, I feel just like when I'm 50. Which third you want to be in? How much you want to be upstream? Well, this is my son, this is my daughter, these are my two grandkids. It's a great pleasure to wake up in the morning and see them. And I always remember the famous words that it's not attributed to Mickey Martin, but he said it. If I knew I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. So I challenge you all, dare to go upstream. Don't forget, we need all the tourists we could get in the Bahamas. These are some <laughs> lovely beaches. Thank you very much. I want to thank you for an absolutely wonderful presentation. And I just don't want you to give up hope. Um, what we've taken to doing at these presentations now is actually live streaming them so that we will be using this presentation out in the community. Um, but thank you so much because this is, this is the critical information. We are not going to take a break at this point, by the way, and so I would like to invite those people who are on the next panel up. But before we do that, I'd like to know if, if there are any questions for Dr. Roberts. You know, we are, yes, Dr. Sweeney.
the same kinds of disparities that we see here, uh, taking care of a car by not your person, um, go on in the Bahamas as in the United States. Yeah. Oh, excuse me, one last thing. Uh -huh. I, I did, this is a comment. Um, I, I was the clinical director of the Federal Qualified Health Center, and I couldn't get men to come into the center to get physicals. Yeah. So I put a sign up that said, come in and talk to us about <laughs> no, you, you, you know, it's, it, it's a part of the culture in terms of your sexual problems, you know, anything that betters that, you know, they, you, 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 you got to hook them in. Healthcare is very, is very uh, complex, and a lot of our diseases and, and how their outcomes is multifactorial. There's a genetic component, and there is no doubt that we've seen in a lot of diseases that in our African, people of African descent are very prone to certain type of diseases more than our white counterparts, okay? I think prostate cancer is one of them because when we look, wherever we see pockets of black men who originally came out of Africa, we see that they have a high incidence of prostate cancer. Uh, we've, we've shown that both in America, we've shown that in the Caribbean. We never used to think it was so in Africa. But it's very clear that it is just the same. It's just that they don't talk about it. In a lot of instances, you don't see it because prostate cancer still is a disease of aging men. And because uh, a lot of the, the, the survival rate longevity is, is low, so we don't see the prostate cancer coming out. But a lot of them die from the prostate cancer or from very, because of infectious diseases, for example, and the prostate cancer is very, very much there. They are not going to talk about prostate and cancer because it also impacts on their sexual being. Now, on the other side, you cannot, ign you cannot ignore availability and accessibility of health care and affordability. And the best example of that is in Britain. They've done the studies to show very clearly that black men who, uh, Dr. Shinagwanda, from, he's uh, originally from, uh, from Africa, but in Britain, and he has actually been knighted by the Queen for, his, for some of the work, he got an OBE for some of the work he's done, but showed very clearly in looking at prostate cancer in men in Britain, whether they're from Africa, whether they're from Caribbean, or whether they still are born in Britain, that their rates of prostate cancer is much higher but the mortality and the morbidity is much different because they have a social health care system. Everyone has equal access to health care. They did an excellent study one time ago, a couple of years ago in Detroit. It's called the DEED study. And they showed that if they got the information out to the men, went out into the community and informed them to come early, get your prostate cancer check, and subsequently provided the, 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 uh, the care for them so they had the equal access they have equitable care. Those who need care get it, and those who need more get more. They showed that their, their morbidity, mortality rate was exactly the same as their white counterparts. So yes, healthcare disparity with regards to those issues that you just talked about, they are real, and they are there, and they impact. But that other component is very clear as well. If you, if you can equalize everyone where we remove the issues of access and availability of care and equitable care, affordability and so forth, then those are the features that we have in terms of those genes come into being and all those other social determinants that we have, like diet and so forth, come about. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Shinagwanda, you mentioned that you have a 